Welcome to my channel. I'm Gio, and I like to write gay fiction. This book is called Speeding. Ethan is gay and an ambulance driver. Pete isn't quite straight anymore. Maybe he never was. Pete is a hoarder. Ethan is a minimalist. And now, Chapter 10. Ethan. We were in my car, Monday morning, heading to Pete's apartment. We had already been to his work. One look at him, and the doctor's note, and he had no trouble taking a couple of sick days. Then we visited the pharmacy, and picked up his pain prescription and an antibiotic. How could I tell Pete I had failed him? Braddock and Tia were the people who had saved him, while I sat useless outside. It had been a long time since I hated myself, and I did right now. Pete stared out the passenger side window, a haunted look about him. I don't think he saw anything but the loss of his unborn child. What worried me? Pete didn't speak. This weekend had dredged up the inner hell he had never told anybody about, and for the first time he had to face. I wouldn't let him face it alone, because when I was a junior in high school, I was alone, and no one was there to help me. I wouldn't fail the man I love again. Pete, I promise. I'm here for you, I said. Pete nodded and continued staring out the window. The Mojave Sands apartment parking lot was half empty. People had already left for work, which meant I could pull up close to Pete's apartment. We climbed out, and I brought the two boxes with me I'd gotten back at the station. To the right of Pete's apartment was the place I sat yesterday. My failure. A middle-aged man had Pete's door open and knelt by it unscrewing the handle and lock. He had a toolkit beside him, and a new lock, and its opened package lay beside him. The man took one look at us and stood up. He spat a big wad of chewing tobacco on the sidewalk. Linda's too nice to a slob like you. I would have kicked you out of here months ago, but Linda has to follow the proper procedures so you don't sue us. Do you know how much business we're losing because of you? Morning, I said. Morning to you too, he said. Pete, I'd like to say I'm sorry you got hurt, except I'm not. That mess was a damn time bomb. Thanks for changing the locks, Jack, Pete said. Like it did any good. Linda said police were here for hours taking pictures, and just after she locked up and before she took off, some high school kid stopped by and asked for you, Jack said. Who was it? Pete asked. You think I know. I wasn't here, and I don't care. If it was up to me, you'd be gone already. Butte Cleaners is coming later today, and if I could, I'd have them start immediately and get this shit out of here, Jack said. Is Linda coming in today? Pete asked. Nope, Jack said. Why not? I asked. Her son-in-law called last night from some hospital in Tempe. Seems Linda's daughter had emergency surgery on her lady parts. Linda's going to be gone for ten days to watch the kids. Maybe two weeks. Maybe the rest of the month. Guess what that means. You deal with me. Linda told me to play nice and play by the rules. With you, I don't have to play nice, and I don't care about the rules. Meaning, Pete said, I come by for an inspection on the 10th, the 20th, and the 30th. If there is a single reason to kick you out, I'm doing it. Guess what I'm arranging for the morning of September 1st. Since Linda's not here, I personally get to choose which cleanup company tosses everything in this dump. And I'm choosing the most expensive one. We're suing you for cleanup, lost revenue, restoring the unit to rentable condition, and my mental trauma for putting up with you, and there's nothing you can do about it. You've had your three warnings. In 21 days, I get to wave bye-bye. Can you do that? I asked. 
Check the rental agreement. Check the safety code. Check with the lawyer. Check with the Humane Society. I don't care. Linda did everything legal. In 21 days, I'm watching you leave, Jack said. But Pete's injured, I said. Ask me, do I care, Jack said, and returned to the handle. He slid something out of the new door handle's box and tossed them to Pete. Your new keys. Enjoy them for the next three weeks, because I'm changing locks in three weeks and one day. Pete didn't move. He must be in shock, because I would be. I had failed Pete yesterday, but I wouldn't today. Somehow, I'd force myself to walk inside. Maybe if I stayed close to the open door, I'd be all right. I wedged the door open with a box of books. I handed Pete one of the empty boxes. Pete, I want you to grab a week's worth of clothes and whatever you need. I'll grab all the mail by the door. Pete nodded, took a box, and limped past Jack. He gasped, or was it a sob? I stepped in behind him, and to my unholy nightmare made worse. I brushed the bugs off me and stamped on one. No, they're only in my mind. The guys yesterday had maneuvered, tossed, or stacked boxes and garbage bags and piles of clothes in random directions to make a path wide enough for the stretcher so they could get peed out. There was no way to get into the kitchen or bathroom now. A pile of clothes had Pete's dried blood on them. What's wrong? Don't you like how your interior decorators organize the place? Jack sneered and gave a mean chuckle. I'm going back to the office until your butt is out of the parking lot. This place makes me sick. Lazy people like you make me want to vomit. After Jack left, Pete sank to the floor and whispered, I can smell what everybody was talking about. I can't do this. I knelt beside him and held him, keeping the open door within touching distance. The panic was still there, but if I stayed close to the door, I could manage for a few minutes. Let me do the thinking for you. Fill the box with clothes, I'll fill this one with mail, and we'll take one other box back to my place and make a plan. We picked up Sabretooth from my mom's place. She'd already left for work. Once back in my apartment, I took Sabretooth to the pet lawn and then put Pete in bed. He looked terrible and gray, and his good hand was cold and shook a little. I filled Sabretooth's dishes, put my clothes and some of Pete's into the washer before I grabbed a quick shower. A soft, muffled sound came from my bed. Was Pete crying? He sat on my bed, hunched over, and stared at his feet. I quickly dressed in shorts and a t-shirt and sat next to him. I want you sleeping, I said. Where will you sleep? Pete asked. Other room. I've got blankets and I'll take my pillow, I said. That's not fair. I'll sleep on the floor, Pete said. No, you won't, I said. You've just come out of the hospital. You've come off shift and you're exhausted, Pete said. I'll take the right side of the bed because of my arm. You take the left. My whole life has fallen apart. Don't leave me alone. I nodded and whispered. Left side it is. If it would get Pete to sleep, I'd do it. Even though I had dreamed about this moment for a couple of years, I knew when to play it cool. Pete might be bi or confused or experimenting, but he wasn't ready for anything more. I closed the curtains and Sabretooth jumped on the bed, sleeping between Pete and me. The pain medication worked quickly and Pete gently snored within seconds. Sabretooth took about a minute before she began snoring. I laid down, placed my hands behind my head, and thought. When would Chief call me? Would I have a job tomorrow? How do I tell Pete I failed him? Even though I was tired, I couldn't sleep. I got up, leaving Pete and Sabretooth snoring together, and went into the kitchen and made brownies, changed the laundry, and went to the store. It didn't get rid of the dull ache in my chest. Pete had called me for help, and I had failed him. Pete My second day of waking in a strange bed. 
The sheets were crisp and smelt clean. Sabretooth lay next to me, and as I stirred, she did. The cool air smelled of vanilla and chocolate and clean laundry. The late afternoon light highlighted the emptiness of this room. Ethan wasted a lot of space. Imagine what I could store here. The hum of a washing machine almost drowned out the gentle guitar and the husky voice that sang with it. Ethan must be playing in the other room. I didn't want to move because right now, nothing hurt. This was what peace felt like. This was what I wanted. I finally pried myself off the bed, hand holding my ribs, and stepped to the closet. Ethan's immaculate closet. It wasn't as empty today. My ironed button-down shirts and ironed t-shirts hung from brand new wooden hangers. My ironed slacks and jeans were folded and on a shelf. My boxers and muscle shirts, also ironed, were folded in a neat stack. My socks were bundled into little balls. My shoes were cleaned and resting neatly on the floor. My clothes might have been fresh off a store's clothing rack. Ethan must have spent a couple of hours ironing and washing. My eyes teared and something ached in my chest. Ethan would make somebody a great husband. Like I would have made a great dad. The pain flooded my chest. My ribs ached. I could have been a dad. I endured until the pain lessened. Sabretooth jumped off the bed and went to find Ethan. I followed the sound of the guitar. Ethan sat in the love seat, his dog sitting next to him. Though Ethan wore only shorts and a t-shirt, was unshaven and exhausted. Something about him made my heart ache. Your whisper left me wanting more. Take my hand and lead me to your love. Ethan softly sang with a trace of a country twang. Ethan fumbled on a chord, and he played the line again and again, then played and sang it perfectly. Your whisper left me wanting more. Take my hand and lead me to your love. I wanted to listen to him forever. Sabretooth jumped off the love seat and ran to the door. She barked. I had kissed Ethan the other night. I wanted to kiss him right now, but I can't. I'm straight. I'm gay. I'm bi. Everything has changed. I don't understand myself anymore. Ethan stood up and noticed me. There was a reluctance about the way he moved, about the way he didn't look at me, about the way he seemed to slouch away. His normally confident voice wavered. You're looking alive. Feel any better, he said. I'm not as stiff, I said, careful not to twist, bend, breathe heavy, or even laughed. Any sudden motion made my ribs scream. Any motion made my ribs scream. Sneezing would kill me. Something about my friend seemed distant. Ethan grabbed the leash and pet waste bags and took Sabretooth outside. I'll be back in a minute. By the door were the two boxes of my stuff. One overflowed with my mail. The other was filled with my old books. Next to them was a brand new shredder. I guess Ethan now owned 201 items. With my left hand, I opened the box of old paperbacks. The scents of my apartment, of mold and rot and damp, seeped out into the clean smell of vanilla and chocolate. These had fallen on me, or a box very similar. I remembered each book because I had read and reread them over and over again. Breathing very shallowly so I didn't have to smell the mold. I pulled one book out. I had read it back in middle school, but now I couldn't remember what it was about. I flipped through the pages, ignoring the whiffs of mold and mildew. Somehow, a mouse had gotten in the box and died, its small body flattened by the books. Those aren't you anymore, Ethan said. His eyes were tired, and though he smiled, there was something sad about them. Are you okay? I asked, and inwardly winced. That was one question I avoided asking Ethan, because when he had a bad day, it meant somebody had died. Yesterday, somebody did. 
It's been a long couple of days for me, too, Ethan said. It started with the kid that died in your rig yesterday. Do you want to talk about it? I asked. In a day or two. I'm not ready tonight, Ethan said. That was Ethan's way of saying that I wouldn't like it. Best not to press for details. What do you mean that these books aren't me anymore? That was you back in middle school, say, eight years ago. You weren't old enough to drive then. That person was worried about finishing assignments, about zits, and dealing with his mom. He was not worried about paying bills and dealing with life, Ethan said. Because you're hanging on to the past so hard, it prevents you from living in the now. Those years might have been great. Those books might have been dear to you. But now they are rotting around you, keeping you from being fulfilled. What's the worst thing that could happen if you threw them in the dumpster tonight? I might miss them, I said. The ones you really like, you can buy again, Ethan said. But trust me, once they are gone, you won't remember them. Isn't that an argument for keeping them? I asked. You've been hanging on to the past for too long, and look where it's gotten you. Let me put it another way. Whether you like it or not, you're moving in three weeks. This box stinks. One just like it broke your arm, and you don't read the books. It's pushing you out of your own apartment. What is so important about these books that you would live on the streets for them? What if I got a storage unit and put everything there? I asked. They did that with my grandfather's stuff. Let's do the math. You rent a basic storage closet at $100 a month. You'll need a bigger one than that, but this keeps the math simple. In a year, you've wasted $1,200 a month. Tell me this book is worth $1,200. A lot of people forget about their storage unit and keep it for years. In 10 years, you could have bought a used car with cash with the money you had wasted. Would you rather spend the money on a new computer or watch your stuff slowly rot? I can't throw this book away. That would be a waste, I said. You keep using that word. Let's say you gave your books to the library or used bookstore five years ago. They could check them out to other people, sell them, or donate them to charity. A lot of people could read them. Right now, the library or used bookstore would toss them because the books are rotting and they stink and the mice have burrowed into them. See the little black oval dots? That's mouse poop. This box is contaminated, Ethan said. Hoarding them kept anybody else from enjoying them. That's the true waste. It's also preventing you from getting your life back. What do I do? I asked. Are you ready to hear my plan? Ethan asked. A marathon toss and dump session? I asked. Ethan shook his head. That might work for some people, but not for me. We'll go to your place every day, deal with one box and one bag of clothes, or whatever, and toss trash. We start at the door and work our way back. That's it? I asked. In 20 days, that's 20 boxes, 20 bags of stuff, and 20 bags of trash you'll never have to look at again, he said. And we also start apartment hunting. Ethan took one side of the box, I took the other, and we took the smelly memories out to the dumpster. My phone was ringing on the dining room table when we got back. My brother Roy. Jack said that some high school kid had come by my place. That must have been Roy. Odd. He doesn't drive. Had he walked to my apartment? I answered, What's up? I can't live here anymore, Roy said, his voice higher than normal, and it broke. Roy doesn't cry. What's going on? I asked. These last few days, all Mom does is yell. Nobody loves me, blah, blah, blah. She and Dad got into a huge fight. Then today, she comes home from work, screaming. She was so mad, I thought she'd have a heart attack. Screaming? About what? I asked. That girl you met the other night? I guess her name was Cindy. Mom must have asked her how the day went. Cindy said that you and your boyfriend were the nicest people and were so cute together, and you two looked so nice. She had a wonderful time, and she wouldn't mind double dating with you two again. Ethan, you hear that? Cindy likes us, I said. Cindy was nice to talk to you. Do you think she'd like that and Sean? Ethan said. What was so bad? I asked. 
Mom told her, my son doesn't have a boyfriend. He's straight and dates girls. Cindy said maybe you should listen to your son when he talks to you because he's already told you he was gay. It's just like you don't listen to our customers. Do you know what Dad said? He said, Pete's gay? That makes sense. I should have realized sooner. He wanted you to give him some fashion advice. Talk to Ethan. All it takes is an iron, I said. Then what happened? Mom turned on me and wanted to know if I knew you were gay. I don't know when you tried telling her, but I got mad at Mom and said I'd known since you were in high school. I told Mom that she never listens to anybody and we aren't in third grade anymore. I bet that didn't go well, I said. It didn't. Dad yelled at her and they had a huge fight. They never noticed when I packed a suitcase and took my backpack and my guitar and left. Please, can I stay at your place? I know working at the yogurt shop doesn't pay much, but I'll pay half the bills and clean and whatever. Roy said, I'm not going back. I almost asked, why didn't you call your friends, but answered my own question. Mom was too insecure to allow us friends. The only ones we had were the ones she didn't know about. I'm the only person Roy could turn to. Roy, I'm not at my apartment, I said. I knew it. You're living with your boyfriend, aren't you? Roy said, and his voice wobbled as he cried. What do I do? I'm not going back home. Even if I have to live on the streets, where do I go? I'm scared. Hang on, I said. Why did it feel like life was about to change? I glanced at Ethan, not sure what to say. Ethan stood near me and had heard everything. Hand me the phone, Ethan said. I gave it to him. I'm Ethan Sandoval. Pete's boyfriend? Roy asked. Ethan glanced at me, his eyebrows raising. We're working out the details. We don't have a second bed, but I do have a second room. You'll have to sleep on the floor. That's fine, Roy said. I'll pay rent and utilities. Just come get me, please. Give us fifteen, Ethan said. Roy was outside the Mojave Sands apartments, sitting on the sidewalk as we drove up. Before we left my place, we picked up another box of books and a pile of clothes, and I gathered some trash and threw it away. Roy only said one thing when he saw my apartment. It looks like home. Ethan was wrong about Mom. She's not a level two or three hoarder. She's an insecure level fifteen nuclear bomb in high heels. Ethan. The family resemblance was obvious. Same hair, same eyes, almost the same nose. They were brothers, all right. We were back in my apartment, and I had thrown another load of laundry in and hung several things to dry in my little balcony. Summer heat in Nevada would have them dry in an hour. The first thing Roy said when he entered my place was, We could never have a dog at my place. He'd get lost. Pete had to explain the accident at his apartment, and then he explained the two hundred things to his brother. Roy had fled their house with the few clothes he could pack, his laptop, phone, and a few books. He read through my list over and over again. I had some leftover hangers, so I gave them to Roy to hang up his clothes. He didn't even have a week's worth, but maybe we could go shopping in a couple of days and get him what he needs. Sean, Thad, and Pepperoni came over, bearing a lasagna, and the five of us ate. Pepperoni was a white fur chihuahua with beige ears and a beige spot on her side. It became a party. If this keeps up, I might have to buy more dishes. I pulled out my music and my guitar, and Roy and I jammed for an hour. Pete, Sean, and Thad watched a preseason football game while shredding papers. Sabretooth lay at my feet, softly snoring, and Pep chewed on a chew bone. I lived for the quiet moments like these. If Connor and Mary were here, this would be my family. Pete it was a little after nine, just after halftime, when Roy's phone rang. His ringtone was a snippet from some rap song, black high heels and a sexy black dress. Mom? I want you home, now. Where are you? she demanded. I'm with Pete and his boyfriend, Roy said. You can't make me come back to that nightmare. How can you say that? It's our home. Don't you love me? I'm your mom. We're a family. You're my family. Mom yelled. Mom, don't give me that bullshit, Roy said. 
Don't talk to your mother like that, Mom yelled. Give me that, a male voice said. Roy, I don't blame you for running away, and I'm glad you found a safe place. I think it's better you're gone for a while. Do you need anything? Gone, Mom screamed in the background. No, Dad, Roy said. Give me Pete, Dad said. I took the phone as if I were picking up a live rattlesnake. Yeah, Dad? So you're gay? Dad asked. Sean and Thad had heard none of this, and Ethan didn't know what to believe about me. I didn't know what to believe about me. My deception with Cindy had worked too well, except it wasn't a deception. What do I tell my dad, or Ethan, or Sean, or Thad? My mouth suddenly felt like it had cotton stuffed in it. Sabretooth snored, oblivious to the drama. Sabretooth had the perfect life. Why can't I have her alive? Pepperoni looked up at some noise on the TV, then returned to her chew bone. Pepperoni had the perfect life. Why can't I have her life? I told the strange, mixed-up truth that I had barely accepted. Dad, I think I'm bisexual, and I've fallen in love with the most wonderful man. His name's Ethan. Everybody in the room stared at me. The line went quiet a moment. Sean held Thad's left hand and rubbed the gold ring. I think he whispered, I love you, to his husband. I couldn't read Ethan's look. I'm happy for you, son. I never understood when you tried to tell me before. I'm sorry about that. I guess I couldn't hear you over your mom's caterwauling, Dad said. Don't blame this on me, Mom yelled. Terry, I do blame you for a lot of things. I should have spoken up sooner. Pete, do you need anything? Dad said. No, Dad. Ethan and I have everything under control, I said. Does Roy have a bed? Dad asked. No. We have an extra room, but we only have the one bed, I said. My boy is sharing another bed with another person. They're living together. They're having sex. He's not old enough, Mom said. Be quiet, Terry. Pete's 22 and Roy is 17. They are men now. Accept it. Pete, is it okay with Ethan if we bring Roy's bed over and Roy stayed with you until we sort this mess out, Dad said. You can't mean that, Mom said. Roy's my baby boy. He belongs here. I'm getting him away from you, Dad yelled. We'll divide rent and utilities three ways while he's here, Ethan said. The second bedroom is his. Give me your address and a half an hour and I'll bring the bed over, Dad said. You can't do that. There isn't room to get it down the hall, Mom screamed. Then you better make room, Dad yelled. The line clicked dead. There was silence for a minute before Thad spoke. That must have been some date. I tried not to blush as I stared at Ethan. It had finally become clear. I was in love with my best friend. Ethan knows how to kiss, I said. I want details. Juicy details, Thad said. Later, husband, Sean said. I want to be gone before any more drama explodes. Ethan, Pete, call us tomorrow. Nice to meet you, Roy. Once my friends had left, Roy looked up from his guitar and said, I'm sorry about this, guys. Ethan, me too, I said. For a second, Ethan looked at both of us, then shrugged. It will be nice having the company. While we're waiting, let's go over the bill so we know exactly what is expected. And guys, there's a few rules too, Ethan said. Don't tell me. Do your chores, Roy said. Growing up is more than living on your own, Ethan said. My aunt taught me that. Thirty minutes later, I had taken a pain pill because my ribs ached so much. Roy was playing his guitar while glancing at the door every two seconds, and Ethan pulled his triple chocolate cheesecake brownies from the oven and set a bottle of chilled wine on the counter. Somebody knocked on the door. I opened it. Dad held one end of Roy's mattress. Mom held the other. Dad gave a pleasant grin. Mom frowned. Dad wore his old work clothes, a blue shirt with the logo for Butte Plumbing and faded jeans, and he probably put his miles on our old blue Chevrolet truck as Ethan did on the ambulance. Mom wore a chartreuse blouse and black slacks and pumps. She fretted every morning on her makeup and hair and dyed it regularly to hide the gray. You must be Ethan, Dad said. 
Thanks for taking Roy in. It's not a problem. Welcome to my home, Mr. Stone, Mrs. Stone, Ethan said. My name's Robert, but my friends call me Bob, Dad said. This is my wife, Terry. Don't talk to me, Mom said. Terry, be grateful that Roy had somewhere safe to go, Dad said. And it's a nice place. Plenty of room, too. Mom grunted, but didn't smile. Dad, Mom, come in, I said, careful not to get close enough to bump my ribs. What happened to you? Mom asked. I'm a hoarder, just like you. Some of my boxes fell on me, I said. It wasn't as hard to talk about it now. Something inside me changed as soon as I told my friends. They would help me so I could get back to normal. Whatever normal is. Ethan took over the conversation, smiling and showing how good he is with people. I'm Ethan Sandoval. Thanks for coming over. Bed goes on the door on the right. Maybe we can sit down in a few minutes and get to know each other? I've made brownies, and we can open some wine, at least for us, but I've got a cola for Roy. My parents dragged the mattress into the bedroom, while Ethan and Roy went down to the truck to get the box springs and frame. My job? Holding Sabertooth's leash. This room only has a bike, Mom screeched from the second bedroom. I stood in the front doorway, and it gave me the perfect vantage. On the level below, Ethan and Roy wiggled the box springs out of Dad's old truck. Inside, Mom walked across the hall and into the master bedroom, the bedroom I shared with Ethan. There was a noise that sounded like hangers being moved on a closet rod. Was Mom snooping in our closet? Terry, don't be rude, my father called into the bedroom. I have every right to know what kind of person seduced my son, Mom snarled. Sabretooth and I walked up to the master bedroom and looked inside. The closet doors were open, revealing a perfectly organized closet with lined-up shoes and ironed clothes. It looked like something out of a magazine. It looked like I had moved in. Mom stood by the nightstand, with its lamp and the vase of fresh flowers and the picture of Ethan and Spencer. Except Ethan had changed the picture. The picture was now of our shirtless group, Thad, Sean, Connor, Ethan, and me, goofing off at the basketball court. Thad and Sean were kissing. The sunlight glinted off one of their rings. Mom's lips moved as if she were chewing on something, and she scowled. Mom opened the nightstand drawer and picked up a condom, then set it back. So that's where Ethan kept them. Mom slammed the drawers shut. The lamp wobbled, the vase wobbled, but they didn't fall. Mom's face went white, her voice grim. What kind of a man has flowers? Blame it on the pain meds, but I was in a mood. I went to the flowers, pulled a white rose from the vase, and scattered its petals over the comforter. Flowers are fun. Dad gave a soft snort, and was that a smile hiding on his face? Mom marched out of the bedroom, lips pursed, brow furrowed, and went to the bathroom, Ethan's pristine and hotel-like bathroom. Terry, stop snooping, my father called after her. Ethan and Roy walked in with the box springs. Mom marched out of the bathroom, past me, past the box springs, and into the kitchen. While the rest of us watched, she opened one cupboard, then another, and another, until all were open even the organized pantry and organized fridge. It's common courtesy to ask before you invade someone's privacy, Ethan said. His voice had hardened, but he still tried to be polite. Would you like some brownies and wine? You have nothing from your childhood, nothing saved for your grandchildren, nothing for emergencies. It's clean, psychotic clean, and now you're stealing my children from me. You're sick, Mom said. Terry, enough of that, Dad said. Ethan, I apologize for my wife. Terry, say you're sorry. Apologize? I will never apologize, Mom sneered. Mom was losing it. Ethan's smile wavered and disappeared. Fine, if you want to be nice, then neither will I. It's clean, because, just like the rig I drive, I respect my apartment. It's sanitary. There aren't mice, rats, ants, or cockroaches and I know exactly what I have and where everything is. Can you say the same about your house? Stop it, Mom. 
Ethan only keeps 200 things. That's why his place looks so much better than ours, Roy said. I'm going to do the same, and so is Pete. You can throw all that garbage you're saving out. Garbage? Those things are your old toys and clothes. Those are my memories. I'm saving them for my grandkids, Mom screamed. I stared at the ceiling and endured the soul ache deep inside. Mom never knew about the abortion or the pain I still felt. Mom, my kids will never play with that old junk. It stinks and is broken, Roy yelled. Ethan stepped beside me and took my hand. If Mom scowled any more, her face would fall off. It's okay, Pete. I don't know why your mom brought so much hate, Ethan said, giving my hand a squeeze. You should see our house, Roy said. You can't even breathe in there. It's because Mom needs that stuff to hide from her emotions, I said. Let me tell you a secret I learned the hard way. She doesn't realize that if something happened to her, you and Pete and your dad and every relative you have will have to clean up after her. She doesn't love you and Roy, only the memory of her boys a decade ago, Ethan said. Mom is a severe disorganized hoarder whose focus is her kids, I said. It's sad. Mom loves her stuff more than her family. She's pushing us out, Roy said. Terry, that's what I've been trying to tell you, Dad said. You're siding with an ignorant, vicious homewrecker? It's my stuff, Mom screamed. Mom needs a psychologist, Roy muttered. If your house is anywhere near as bad as Pete's apartment, your family will spend every weekend after you die cleaning and tossing. They won't remember their mom as kind and loving. They'll hate you for making them clean up after you. They'll spend so much time throwing out your stuff that they won't care if it's valuable or sentimental or an heirloom. They'll toss and toss and toss just to get the job done. That's what happened with my grandfather's hoard. I don't remember him with any kind of love, not for what he put me through. Tell me, Terry, is that how you want Pete and Roy and your husband to remember you? Ethan said. You don't know anything, Mom screamed. I do, Ethan said, because I've lived through it. Mom, we're not kids anymore. We're adults, but you won't see that, I said. Ethan's poisoned Cindy against me, and you, and my husband, and Roy. Everyone I work with thinks I'm a terrible mother. Me, your mother, Cindy pitied me. What's next? Your dad divorces me because I like to keep my memories? I'm not getting rid of anything, Mom yelled. So we get to clean up after our paranoid control freak of a mom, Roy yelled. Terry, calm down. Don't be a Karen, Dad said. Ethan, I hate you, and you are never welcome in my house. And Pete, I don't approve of this relationship. End it, Mom screamed. I'm sorry. If Mom doesn't get her way, she throws a tantrum, Roy said. Terry, Ethan welcomed us into his home. Yet how do you treat him? You rampage through his apartment, looked through all his belongings, yelled at him, and insulted him. It's time you acted like an adult, Dad said. Tempers are getting a little overheated. Let's calm down, have some wine, and start over, Ethan said. Honey, I think that's a good idea, Dad said. Let's get to know the man our son is in love with. You side with the nympho, too? Look at his empty apartment. He's sick. He's stolen my family from me. I will not get rid of anything, and I will not be judged, Mom screamed and stomped out of the apartment. Does that mean you won't come to our wedding? I yelled after her. Mom swore, flipped me off, and furiously marched to Dad's truck. Dad looked at me as if I had gone crazy. Wedding? Roy slowly smiled. Ethan looked at me and blew a long, slow breath out. His shoulders relaxed and he chuckled. Pete, that box definitely hit your head too hard. Let's get you to bed, boyfriend. In front of my dad and brother, I kissed Ethan. Then I realized what I had just said. Wedding? Why do I do this to myself? Blame it on the pain meds. Down in the parking lot, Mom laid on the horn of the truck and didn't let up. Thanks for joining me, my friends. See you next week. Peace.